Okay, we uh, start up. Some messages. No lecture tomorrow. I'll be away. And the topic today should then be a little bit about uh, about uh, gas flow and uh, shock waves, and then specifically more flow in a uh, convergent divergent nozzle because that's something uh, we are going to look at on the next report exercise. First of all, uh, this exercise number six that you are fighting with and you have a deadline on Friday. So, a uh, little comment there. I have tried and tried and tried and no matter what I do, I get the following. I get something like this for the different uh, probes. So, yes, I have a time lag. And I have tried with meshes, with uh, Cura numbers, with um, schemes, turbulence models. I get the same no matter what I do. Has anybody got anything better than me? Don't you dare say yes. Very good. <coughs> now, your job was to create uh, error bars. <coughs> so you can see I have some small error bars here. And actually they are very small. Now, <coughs> according to say the ideal theory, of course the experimental results should be within our error bars, then it would be perfect. And uh, you see they are uh, not even close, not even close. Of course we can cheat. So here, for instance, in my script, here I have calculated an average uh, p-values over the different eight uh, probes. And I use that p-value to create uh, the different uh, grid convergence indexes. So if I now simply say my order is uh, 0.1, why not? And then you should see the effect. 0.1 means you have a terrible mesh. And then you see the uncertainty really raises. Now I am within the, uh, say, the experiments. Well, not that one actually, <laughs> but most of them now will be a little bit closer. So, of course, a scheme with uh, an order 0.1, <laughs> what kind of scheme is that? So, uh, the order should be around 2. I think I had 2.3 or something in my calculations. But, I mean, this is the philosophy with these uh, error bars. Of course, it's tricky with this problem here when we have a transient uh, simulation. So, my suggestion, using uh, 2 seconds, to calculate an average p-value for all eight probes and use that p-value for all values. Maybe not so realistic. But then, of course, mm. I would actually question this experiment. If I do the following here, just for fun, let's see now, where are we? Somewhere uh, here, experiment. Yeah, here's the time for the experiment. So if I multiply with 8 and divide by 7.2, I think it was. And then you can see the difference. Now we're talking. I think the stopwatch in this uh, experiment was wrong. Now you see I have a very, very nice fit with uh, sort of the same behavior as, as the experiment. So my conclusion would be, I'm right and the experiment is wrong. Very easy. And uh, also I have some questions about these uh, experiments. Why did they only use one experiment? Why didn't they use 10 experiments and then created an average? Would be much, uh, say, more realistic. And uh, why didn't they report the error uh, measurements for the pressure sensors. Of course there's a plus or minus there as well. So I would have very much liked to have these uh, experimental data including error bars. 
that would be more, say, precise. I mean, <coughs> it's a scientific principle. When you do an experiment, of course, it should be repeatable. And same with you guys. When you do a simulation, then the reader of your article or your report should be able to perform the same uh, simulation as you have done and obtain the same result. That's how much information you should give a reader. And I mean, that's a lot of information, and uh, normally you don't have space for that. Put it in the appendix if possible. But I mean, that's sort of a demand here for this scientific principle. Any simulation, any experiment should be repeatable. Of course it should. So uh, here, I would say this experiment is uh, way off. So don't worry about it if you are in, uh, yeah, if you have the same time delay as I got. No problem there. Any questions about exercise uh, six? That's okay now. Goody. Then I have provided you with an exercise uh, seven. <coughs> Put a deadline uh, Friday, 1st of November. And uh, yeah, it's an ordinary <coughs> exercise, <coughs> so no report there. So you do it uh, individually. So it's a couple of cases that uh, I will uh, recommend that you can play around with. First one is quite nice, actually. You have, uh, uh, it's from the 50s, so it's an old one. Uh, at least the theory here um, from uh, Bachelor. You have a double window <coughs> and you have a gap between the windows with an air pocket for insulation. And then if you have uh, hot inside the room and cold on the outside, you will get some uh, flow inside this uh, cavity. And if the driving force is not too strong, then you will actually have a very nice here, a laminar uh, well, it's not laminar, well, both of them are laminar, actually. But uh, you will have one big, huge vortex going up and down, something like this, with the streamlines. And the temperature will vary linearly across this tiny little gap. And, uh, yes, we had a guy called Bachelor, and he was no fool. You can worry, uh, wonder why it's called uh, taking a bachelor. Well, here you have the uh, the uh, solution here, <laughs> or actually the explanation. So uh, I'm quite impressed actually what he did in uh, here, early 50s, without computers, without anything. And he did a lot of theoretical uh, work on this uh, problem. And he came up with this analytical nice solution. So this exercise will then be, first of all, to repeat <coughs> this, uh, this uh, situation here where you have one big vortex and then you get this nice profile. It goes like a cubed uh, polynomial and you have the linear temperature variation. The driving force in this problem is called the Grassoff number. I guess you haven't heard about that one before. But you can see it's depending on the temperature difference and then the expansion coefficient. Same as uh, you I showed you with this uh, Bernard cell uh, tutorial. So that's the driving force. Here, T infinity, and that's the bulk uh, temperature which then has to be, for this problem, I would say the temperature in the center. The width in meters, of course, is not big. Two centimeters, I would recommend. But to do this, you definitely need, uh, say, a narrow opening here, but you need a very tall cavity. So uh, at least uh, 30 times uh, the width. So 60 centimeters or something like that, to make it work. And then comes uh, some interesting things. If the Grassoff number is smaller than 10,000, that's a critical Grassoff number, smaller than 10,000, you will have one big, nice uh, vortex. If you go beyond 10,000, this one vortex will break up into several small ones. It's not turbulent 
and it's stable, steady. So it's still laminar. And uh, this should happen. Now a guy called Pawlopowski, he did a test with uh, Fluent and uh, a program called FeedUp, a finite element program, where he simulated this case. And he plotted here the velocity profile along the center line. So yes, you will have a velocity going to the right at the top and at the left at the bottom, but here they just go up and down, hence the center velocity horizontally will be zero. And for uh, the uh, case, uh, I think he used 8,500 uh, or something, I mean below the critical uh, Grassoff number. Yeah, both programs got the correct one. Then he increased the Grassoff number to 15,000. Then it should be a row of uh, small vortices. But then you see Fluent didn't get it at all. Sort of get the same solution. While feed up finite element program, he achieved it. He made <coughs> it. And the reason was then, in those days, 90, uh, Fluent was built on not finite volume, but actually finite difference. And yes, they used first order upwind. Smear out every problems, and then no, you don't catch the physics at all. Terrible. So for this exercise, I would suggest you try to do the same. You try with uh, first achieving uh, just one big vortex, independent on whatever scheme you choose, and then go to Reynolds number, no sorry, Grassoff number 15,000, and then see if you can capture this one, and try then with then first order upwind scheme and see if this one sort of disappears. You smear it out and you get uh, the wrong solution. So that is, uh, I would say, a good uh, test case for any, uh, for any software. So keep that one in mind. Second problem, that was this nice uh, shock wave. You have a Mach 3 hitting a small, tiny little cylinder. So I have given you this uh, mesh, structured mesh, block mesh dict. Yes, you can create uh, nice uh, circular uh, geometries in block mesh, it's possible. And see that you can obtain the same solution, finding these nice uh, Mach wave waves around uh, this cylinder. So, uh, first, I would suggest then you play with uh, the simple sonic foam. And you had a nice setup here, it's called a forward step, I think I showed you last time where you get shock waves inside a channel with a forward step. And the sonic form here, yes, you may use uh, actually Euler equations. You can remove the viscosity, it's not important here. Well, of course, you have a small boundary layer here, close to the walls, but that one is not important for this, uh, say, the, the physical phenomena that we are looking at, namely the, uh, these shock waves. So try with that one first. Second, a little bit more advanced, then I would suggest <coughs> play with rho simple form of the transient, rho pimple form. He should be able to do the same. So I must admit that one is not so easy. I tried it myself and I haven't succeeded yet. So they're a little bit tricky. They are sort of exploding no matter what you do, so um, they are uh, touchy, they are touchy. And yes, why should we look at this one? Well, let's see now if we have Google here. Yes, we have open foam, convergent, divergent nozzle. If we can find this one, I think it was that one. Yeah, we need some commercial first. So <coughs> this is what I plan for uh, exercise number eight. That will be a report exercise. So I want you to simulate the flow in a convergent divergent nozzle and see if you can obtain the shock structures that's supposed to be there. 
So first, here I have a child with an unstructured mesh. <coughs> Never mind that. So yes, you have these nice shock waves up here, the Mach numbers. <coughs> and here the density, I guess. Yeah. So, and here you have a nice structured mesh, which you then easily can create in, uh, in uh, block mesh yourself. No problem. So this is then your aim for exercise 8. And I think it should be fairly easy, actually, to create this mesh. You need, uh, well, let's pause this one. Or we can go back to the mesh. Here we are. Stop. Ah. Here we are. <coughs> So if you sort of have a uh, reservoir here, you just say you have a pressure and you have uh, whatever you want on this side as an inlet. Then you will have uh, one block covering this uh, domain. You will have one block then continuing here and then a third block up here. Fairly easy geometry. Remember, in one block, you can create a nice, uh, say, top that is a spline or a polynoom or whatever you want within one single block. So no, you don't have to be straight lines. So that, that mesh should be quite easy to, to obtain. So uh, this is what to come. Any questions to that one? Yeah. What's the, um, uh, like, uh, that was used for the other half of the nozzle? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they have used a symmetry line here, so you only simulate half. <coughs> yeah. So the nozzle here, you see, it goes like that, but you only simulate half of it. Well, they have plotted, uh, say, here up the Mach numbers, and then they have mirrored it down, and then plotted the density here. But it, uh, it's only the half. Uh, of course, you use the symmetry, so and it's a, only a two-dimensional, uh, uh, two-dimensional simulation. So it's the U uh, on the top and the row at the bottom. Yeah. yeah, and here they have flipped it. So now you only simulate half of it. Of course, you use symmetry. You always cheat wherever you can. So do it as cheap as possible. I think that one should be a nice uh, test case. Other questions? Okay, then let us continue. Yeah, one thing. I have also provided you with some material, called it background material, for the gas uh, flow, and it should be here somewhere. Uh, lecture notes from. Uh, what is it? Tap something. Uh, fluid uh, two. And I believe yeah, Tap forty one thirty three. I know several of you guys mm -hmm. haven't had it. So uh, here you'll then find a whole bunch of uh, handwritten lecture notes that will sort of be the background for this uh, uh, this uh, convergent uh, divergent. Uh, channel flow. So it's a variable area duct. You'll find it mostly here and then a little bit more explanation about shock waves and uh, also oblique uh, shock waves. So uh, yeah, you have a lot of background material here. I mean, it's too much of course, you see there's plenty of lectures here, but uh, at least you have, a, you have it as a reference material. So I'll try now to go through uh, the theory behind what's needed then for uh, this uh, Con convergent divergent nozzle. I'll try to do it quick and uh, dirty. So, uh, so let's see. Yeah, we talked about uh, Mach numbers. Finding uh, the uh, speed of sound, and we talked about doing things easy. 
and then we are talking about isentropic flows, meaning the entropy is uh, constant. So it's adiabatic and uh, reversible, so uh, we sort of have skipped uh, a lot of uh, problems. Now let's see, no chalk, never chalk here. <coughs> So, let's start with uh, subsonic, <coughs> subsonic motion. Subsonic meaning you have a Mach number, uh, Mach number which then equals your speed in your flow divided by the uh, speed of sound, typically A, will then be smaller than uh, 1. And uh, if you now think of an object moving, so uh, here we have an object, and now he will uh, create, uh, say, sound waves or waves around him when he moves through a flow. And this information will, of course, spread out in all directions. So say now, uh, at this location, uh, he was there for three time units ago. Three time units. Then we will have something like uh, three. Then we have a nice circle here. That means the information when he was here has, has gone so far. And then he moves to this point. Now the information is two time windows. Uh, and then we will have a circle around this one with uh, two. And now, if this one is uh, 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 maybe looking something like this, and then here is one, looking something like that. Well, that was not a good uh, drawing, actually. The last one should actually go somewhere around this. Meaning, the front, he will always be, say, to the left of this object moving in the flow. So, uh, you will then hear him before you see him, you might say. The information travels in front of the object. But, if you look at a sonic problem, then we do it like that, and then we do it like that. <coughs> What's going to happen then? Well, then this information we sort of build up and then hit the same point. And uh, that means the information now is not traveling ahead. So the sound waves in front of this object is sort of building up. So that's where you sort of pass, pass the sound barrier which means here you don't hear anything. So when you see a jet fighter uh, flying above us and then he uh, is flying with uh, Mach 1, then uh, you can see him but you don't hear anything. If you are standing down here, you won't hear anything before the sound waves, well he may be all the way over here before the sound waves hit you. And here this is then what you call the zone of silence. The information cannot pass to the left of the motion. So that's sonic. And then even worse, we speed up and then we will have super sonic. So now the Mach number is greater than one. So then we will have sort of this image here. And yes, you will have then the shock waves going like that. So then this entire sector will now be this zone of silence. So this is sort of what we are talking about with the uh, shock waves. 
Yes, you are moving faster than the speed of sound. The information can't travel upstream. So uh, we will then form what we call shock waves. OK. <coughs> Let's dive in a little bit here into this theory. So the first one is to look at uh, what we call then uh, the area velocity, area velocity <coughs> relation. So we have the following geometry. We can just use this uh, convergent, divergent uh, nozzle. That's uh, quite OK. So let's uh, do it easy here. And then we have x and y. Yes, we can uh, limit ourselves to a steady state two dimensional uh, situation. Not a problem. And then, uh, yeah, we will have a velocity here somewhere. U going in the x direction. Now we have a whole bunch of assumptions. <coughs> assumptions. We assume uh, the velocity in the streamwise direction much, much bigger than uh, the cross stream direction. Meaning this channel is uh, quite elongated. So the area change in the x direction is not that big. Hence, the v-velocity here is going to be quite small, at least compared with the, uh, with the velocity, the horizontal velocity here. Hence, yes, we can treat this as a sort of a one-dimensional problem then. Very easy, <coughs> very easy. And then we skip the viscosity. We don't need it. We can look at Euler equations. That's quite OK. And uh, we don't have any, you don't have any heat fluxes, so uh, it's totally adiabatic, no problem uh, there. And uh, actually, we don't need gravity either, so he doesn't change much anyway. I mean, it's air for crying out loud, so the gravity forces they're not going to be big anyway. And then, uh, if you look at some uh, cross sections here. We can have a cross section here and here and whatever you want. Really doesn't matter. What will now the continuity equation say? Continuity. Well, should be fairly straightforward. You will then have uh, the uh, velocity. And then, yes, we treat him as a constant over the cross section multiplied with the local density and then the local area in point one, of course, has to balance u rho a at point two, which is the same as the uh, mass flow. Well, mass flow here divided by uh, the width inside uh, the blackboard. If you want it in 3D, you have a width b inside the blackboard. So that one, uh, of course, straightforward. Hence. Rho g h has to be constant, independently where you are. OK? Take the derivative of that one. Take the derivative of these three. What do you get? Well, <coughs> we will then have to use the train rule. So uh, let's see now. We have uh, d dx of the continuity equation which reads u rho a is constant, OK? Then uh, we should have then uh, u a, and then we'll have the rho dx plus, and then I choose rho a on the outside, and then we will have the u dx, and then finally we will have rho u on the outside, and then the change of the area with respect to x equals 0. Because, I mean, the mass flow is constant, and then derivative of a constant, 0. So there we have one nice continuity equation. Multiply that one with 1 over the mass flow, rho u a. 
and then you will have a nice uh, equation looking something like this should be 1 over rho d rho dx and then we have 1 over u and then we will have du dx and then finally 1 over the area the area dx equal to be 0 so there we have a nice equation of course this dx you can actually remove here yeah what is m dot over b uh, the m dot uh, I usually use m for mass. m dot as a time derivative of mass, meaning the mass flow in kilograms per second. But since this is a 2D case, then uh, the b then has to be the width. Well, if you use this area also as the total area, then you don't need this b. You can use b equals 1 if you like. Shouldn't really change much. Other questions? So as I said, we don't need this dx. We're going to remove him in the end anyway. OK, let's see now. I need some more space here. We keep that one. <coughs> then we have the momentum equations. How will he look? Momentum equations. Remember, we have removed the viscosity, so this is just the Euler equation. And uh, we don't have many terms here. One assumption I didn't uh, write down, we look at a steady state situation, so we don't have the time derivative even. So uh, what will the momentum equation look like? Well, you have the, uh, the uh, nonlinear terms, advection terms. So here we have a du dx. And that's the only acceleration that we have. And on the other side, we will have the pressure. We will have minus the PDX, like that. And when it was isentropic, <coughs> isentropic, we have the following connection here with the change of pressure dx, that actually equals the sound of speed squared, multiplied with the change of the density with respect to x. So I can now use that one. And then here we will now have a connection instead of the pdx, we use the speed of sound and then the density change, something like that. Much easier. So uh, this one then, let's see now, we have it there, so uh, yeah, we don't really need this uh, dx anymore, so we can rewrite this equation to something, something like this. We will then have a d rho divided by rho equals and then uh, we can rewrite this one to minus Mach number squared, and then we'll have du by u. So if you divide here, then you will have, should have u squared over a squared to get Mach number squared. <coughs> one point here, this Mach number, <coughs> that's important, <coughs> m, that is the local Mach number. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, you have to look at the velocity at the different points. You can have uh, different Mach numbers uh, in different locations, of course you can. So, Mach number is not necessarily any constant uh, uh, entity. So, uh, no, he can change, of course. Of course. <coughs> okay. Then, if the Mach number is uh, small. If Mach number small, then we can say uh, here, if the Mach number is small, then we can sort of neglect this uh, thing here. A small number squared, well, that one is going to be even smaller. 
very small. So then forget about it. So then we can say, uh, well, we can write it formally, du d rho over rho. He will then be much, much bigger than the change of velocity, relatively, meaning rho roughly constant is OK. We looked up, uh, at that one uh, last time when we looked at uh, the flow hitting an object, looking at the stagnation pressure, stagnation density, temperature, whatever, and looked at the effect of the Mach number. And if Mach number was smaller than, and then we said 0.3, then yes, you are allowed to use uh, incompressible flow. Same goes here. Same goes here. But now it's possible here then to combine uh, our equations here. Let's see now. If we, well, we can remove the dx here, not important. You can insert this one inside here then, like that. Then we should be good to go. And what do you obtain? Yes, you obtain the uh, area velocity relation. So let's have a look at that one. <coughs> and he will look something like this. You will have the change of velocity relatively. You equals, and then on the other side, you will have the change of area relatively, and then divided by, and then comes Mach number minus one. There you have it. There you have the velocity area relation. And that one is quite uh, informal. That one is quite informal. <coughs> Remember the geometry that we are looking at, something like this. So we are sending in something here through this uh, convergent-divergent nozzle. If Mach number is small or zero, then uh, no problem. So uh, say uh, M is uh, zero, well that's in incompressible flow. Incompressible, incompressible, and uh, yeah, the uh, change in velocity is going to be proportional, sort of an uh, infinity sign, but uh, just uh, not connected here. Uh, he's proportional to the negative area. Of course, is the negative change of the area. So. Uh, if the area becomes smaller, then the velocity has to increase. I mean, that's uh, common sense, isn't it? And if the area becomes bigger, then the velocity becomes smaller. So yeah, that's uh, for incompressible flow. That makes sense, no problem. Now, if uh, we have the subsonic case, then we will have something, something uh, zero, smaller than the Mach number, smaller than one. This is what we call the subsonic. Then what? Well, the negative change of area, it will still be negative, he is now proportional to even more velocity. So here, something is changing. Here something is changing. So uh, if the area becomes smaller, then actually the velocity is going to increase even further beyond the incompressible uh, connection there. S and then supersonic, Mach tau bigger than one, supersonic. Then what? <coughs> Well, now we have something very, very strange. We have the increase of velocity is going to be proportional to the increase of area. So meaning 
in this area, area here, the a is increasing, then the velocity is increasing. It doesn't make sense. Totally crazy. But that's actually a fact. That's going to happen. And then finally, <coughs> Mach number is 1. So then we call it sonic. And then, of course, our <laughs> velocity area relation, it breaks down. We divide by 0. So this means <coughs> this can only happen if the change of area equals 1. And this is important. So, to be brief, if you have a situation where uh, you go beyond the speed of sound, then the Mach number is going to be 1 here. No matter what happens afterwards or even uh, in front, Mach number is 1 here. That's the maximum Mach number you can have. It has to be in the smallest cross-sectional area where, uh, whoops, it should be one, of course, it's zero. <coughs> it has to be in the, uh, say, the smallest area here. <coughs> Can only happen in areas, area where d a is zero. So that's the conclusion from this uh, area velocity relation. <coughs> uh, the one thing here, maybe a little, little uh, strange, this one. We can have a look at it. Mm, let's see. Uh, we don't need that one. So what's happening here, <coughs> actually, when uh, we are in the supersonic uh, range, Mach number square, going to be much bigger than one, you can forget about him. So you can say roughly then that the change of velocity will now be proportional to, uh, well actually, we can multiply him with the Mach number squared. He will then be proportional to the, uh, what will it be? The negative density change, if you insert uh, the other uh, relation that we had. So, a change in velocity, he will then be uh, proportional to a very high change in the density. That's what this uh, relation then uh, means. So uh, if u is then, uh, say, increasing, then uh, density is uh, decreasing a lot. And that means also, if this is going to happen, then if you think of continuity, then the area definitely has to uh, expand. So if this is going to happen, this means dA must be positive due to continuity. In other words, this can only happen when the channel is diverging, not the convergent part, but in the divergent part only. You can't have Mach numbers bigger than one in the convergent uh, nozzle, or convergent part of the nozzle. It has to be divergent. Okay, any questions? Let's then take a break.